Okay, we are now streaming live. Welcome everyone. Our recording has started and we have a stream of guests coming into the webinar. So we're gonna wait a couple moments to make sure that everyone has a chance to get in and check their settings before we begin today's presentation. While guests are coming in, I just wanna give a few housekeeping items. First, we'll make sure that attendees are muted and off camera during the presentation. Second, closed captions are available. If you'd like to be able to read the text, just go to the bottom of your screen and click the CC button. Lastly, we'll have a Q&A later in the program, so feel free to post your questions in the chat, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. Okay, that's it for housekeeping. We'll start here in a couple moments. All right, we're ready to get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Preservation Snapshots Lecture. My name is Quinn Adamowski, and I serve as the Regional Advocacy Manager for Landmarks Illinois. Thank you so much for joining us today. And welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. If you're not familiar with Landmarks Illinois, we are a statewide historic preservation nonprofit founded in 1971 to help people save places that are important to them and their communities. Our advocacy team works on 150 to 200 projects at any given time all across the state. And since our founding in 1971, we have helped save almost 24,000 places. We are glad you joined us today to learn about some of our important ongoing work. Please visit our website to see all that Landmarks Illinois has done and is doing to help people save places for people. You can also visit our YouTube channel to see other great presentations and projects Landmarks Illinois is involved in. We are recording this presentation and it will be uploaded and available on our YouTube channel. Before starting our program, I would like to thank our dedicated and generous members and supporters. Our impact in communities across the state is a direct result of your contributions to Landmarks Illinois. This includes our generous preservation snapshot sponsors, CNH Specialty Craftworks, Jack Corp, and Vinci Hamp Architects. Their support ensures that we can host the lecture series for you on a regular basis. And a special thank, thank you to our annual corporate sponsors. We have a remarkable number of companies who support our work at Landmarks Illinois. If you or your company is interested in supporting our work, we would be happy to speak with you. You can reach out to Tiffany Williams, our Director of Corporate Giving and Events, Again, thank you to our generous sponsors. And thank you to all the members of Landmarks Illinois who are joining us today. Membership support is essential to our success in advocacy, education, and programs. If you're not currently a member, I hope you will consider joining us today at landmarks.org. Finally, as a reminder, if you need closed captioning, just go to the bottom of your screen and click the CC button. Okay, on to our program. Today's lecture is about a place I have the pleasure of working with, Brooklyn, Illinois, which was listed as one of Landmarks Illinois' 2023 Most Endangered Historic Places. Brooklyn is an extraordinarily important community located in the Metro East area, just across the Mississippi River from St. Louis. Brooklyn's rich history includes it being the first majority black town in the United States to be incorporated. Just a few years after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which enshrined the right of Black male citizens to vote, Brooklyn was incorporated in 1873. Brooklyn is also one of the last remaining freedmen or freedom towns, which were majority Black towns settled and developed by emancipated and escaped slaves before and after the Civil War. Though exceedingly important, like so many other freedmen towns, Brooklyn is facing the possibility of erasure from the country's landscape. But today's Preservation Snapshots lecture tells a story of perseverance, a story about Brooklyn's founding in the 18, 1830s by Mother Priscilla Baltimore, the town's incorporation in 1873, to today with the efforts of the Historical Society of Brooklyn, an organization with the mission of preserving the rich history of this momentous town. Members of the Historical Society, like Roberta Rogers and Robert White III, are working to preserve Brooklyn's heritage and save it from decay and land disbursement. 
Landmarks Illinois, along with numerous other partners, is honored to be working with the Historical Society to help raise Brooklyn back up. Our lecture today will be moderated by Layla Wills, Landmarks Illinois Programs Manager, who will be joined by Robert White III of the Historical Society. Please sit back and relax and listen to this fascinating story. Layla? Thank you so much, Quinn. Um, for As Quinn said, I am the Programs Manager for Landmarks Illinois. Uh, this is my second program. Another program that I am super excited to introduce is Brooklyn, Illinois. Uh, and as Quinn said, was featured on Landmarks Most Endangered. And today we are joined with Robert White III from the Brooklyn, Illinois Historical Society. Robert, you're on mute. <laughs> and unfortunately, Mrs. Rogers is not joining us today, but welcome, uh, Robert. Well, good afternoon and welcome, Layla. Thank you and Landmarks Illinois for having me as a guest. Who knew so much history, uh, Black history and, and American history took place right in Illinois? Uh, I don't know if a lot of people know about this, so that's why I'm excited to um, do our part to help spread the story of Brooklyn, the history of Brooklyn, and the challenges Brooklyn is facing and how important it is to our country's heritage and history. So before we get started all the way. Frank, can you advance the next slide? Let us talk about uh, freedom towns and what what is does that terminology mean? So um, I hear we have listed a few of those. We, would you like to tell us what freedom what a freedom town is? Yeah, so freedom towns are, as I understand them, those towns were, that are specifically and intentionally designed uh, by members of our society that were relegated to being enslaved at one point, uh, towns that preserve the rich history and legacy uh, in some ways that goes back all the way back to Africa free enslavement, um, uh, towns that are really just intentional communities, um, safe havens even for people of, of African descent post enslavement. So you see these terms. So freedom towns used to also be called freed men towns, as in um, for slaves who or former or, or Africans who bought their freedom, they could have escaped to freedom, which we'll get into the story of Missouri and Illinois soon. And they were either all black municipalities or majority black and the time frame though is significant especially with brooklyn which we're we're going to get into a lot of um towns that are recognized as being freedom towns were after the emancipation proclamation of 1865 where um you know the slavery was was abolished as an institution um allegedly <laughs> in this country which is why we had juneteenth this week um also all black settlements some were unincorporated but then some got incorporated so um so these are all terminologies that that are um intertwined that we use but that's why I wanted to define what freedom towns are. Oh, and they're also called, they were called colonies because as Quinn um, even, he mentioned at a certain point, we couldn't vote or anything. So you may not have been incorporated or had the right to, to be incorporated and that kind of thing until certain legislation was passed. Now in Brooklyn though, I'm gonna let you tell the story, but um, so tell us tell us about 1829 because I want to show some other things that were going on in the country at in 1829. So, for example, um, next slide, Frank, please. Thank you. And in, in North America, in Mexico, they had a half black president. He was half Mexican and half Black. And in 1829, 
he they, so they were um, fighting for their independence from Spain, and he actually slavery was also an institution in Mexico, and so he abolished that as an institution. Um, the next slide, Franks, and this next town is in Kansas, but if you see the date the 1880s, that was after the Emancipation Proclamation. So now why don't you give us an idea? Oh, you can show the Emancipation Proclamation, Frank, but give us an idea of um, Brooklyn, Illinois, 1829, that the abolitionist movement was pretty heavy. There were writings coming out of the Northeast called the Appeal. I, I believe that was out of Boston, I believe, and uh, Nat Turner, the Nat Turner revolt was only two years later. So the whole issue of slavery, abolition, um, the, this was way before the Civil War, but this, but you could see kind of what was leading up to uh, the Civil War. Next slide, Frank. So now 1829, we have 1829 incorporation, Emancipation Proclamation. So tell us how this fits into the story of Brooklyn. Yeah, so when we look at uh, American history in general, we recognize that 1619 marks the arrival of the first enslaved Africans in Jamestown, uh, Virginia. And so by 1829, slavery was an institution. It was a well uh machine uh, that was in place throughout this, this nation. And so, 1829 in Illinois, it's kind of interesting, right? Because you have uh, Illinois, the, the area that Brooklyn is located is Southwestern Illinois, just across the river, approximately three miles east of Illinois, you have Missouri. So they're separated by the Mississippi River. Missouri is a slave state, Illinois is a free state. 1829, um, a brave woman by the name of we call her Mother Priscilla Baltimore, who was born into slavery, born in Kentucky, uh, sold down the river to New Orleans. Her father was actually her, her master, uh, sold down the river to New Orleans, eventually made her way to the St. Louis area, purchased her own freedom, but she didn't stop there. She wasn't content with uh, just being free herself. She actually went on to uh, tracked down her father, and as the story goes, uh, gave her father quite a tongue lashing, um, but also purchased the freedom of her mother and eventually several of the family members. And so in this quest, in Mother Baltimore's journey, um, again, she wasn't satisfied with just enjoying freedom herself. She wanted to help others become free. And so Mother Baltimore, was a woman's nurse. She worked on the river. She knew how to navigate the river. In fact, she uh, was so well esteemed in St. Louis and in certain circles that uh, she was able to take uh, enslaved uh, Africans from the Missouri side of the river over into Illinois where they would have like Sunday uh, church services. And so she, she knew the land, right? Uh, being a strategically thinking woman, you know she had, the, the wheels were turning right? She was doing some planning during this time. Well, in 1829, um, as the oral, oral tradition has it, Ms. Priscilla Baltimore uh, led 11 families from the slave state of Missouri into uh, the free state of Illinois. Uh, now, it, it's worth noting that uh, there was a white man already on the land by the name of Thomas at Osborne, who was a Methodist. Uh, there was a strong Methodist and Quaker uh, presence speaking to your point about the abolition movement, right? This, this nation was uh, in conflict of, over the issue of slavery. And so um, as Mother Priscilla Baltimore and these 11 families arrived, they established what would later become known as Freedom Village. Um, it's important to recognize, and I, and I hope I'm not getting too uh, far ahead, but it's important to recognize that these people were uh, literate. These people were landowners. Uh, these individuals were um, had wealth even because they, you know, were able to purchase land. And so uh, 
from that act of bravery and courage, you know, you had the development of what would become the village of Brooklyn, which would eventually, we fast forward to 1873, July 8th, which uh, ironically, I thought about this a few days ago, it will be 150 years this year on July 8th, 1873, that Brooklyn was incorporated. 66 men uh, decided to uh, utilize their privilege uh, since the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments had been passed. They said, hey, we're not gonna sit on our thumb idly. We're going to come together. We're gonna strategize. We're going to use the law in our favor. If they deny us, we're going to use the law um, to appeal whatever decision. And they appealed to the state of Illinois to incorporate it. And Brooklyn was incorporated July 8, 1873. So Brooklyn is, so this the title, the first freedom town to yep. be incorporated. So I also um, saw the, uh, you can tell me the name of the organization that did the archeological survey and, and program there. And they also said it was the first black town, majority black town to be incorporated. So how do we know that though? Like how do we know um, Brooklyn was the first town, black town to incorporate? Yeah, so it was incorporated with the state of Illinois. So obviously there are records to validate the claim that Brooklyn was the first to be incorporated. No one has, and, and that word incorporated is a crucial one, right? Because we recognize that there were other black uh, towns that existed before Brooklyn, but in terms of incorporating with the state government, we, we are the first. So, um, but so, but what about across the country? Like, do we know like Florida, Mount, Mount Bayou, and there was, there's other uh, black towns too. So I just, we, I just want to know, you know, whenever I hear, cause there's a lot of, uh, I just read about another all black town, the first right. two, you know what I mean? So I was just trying to figure out, if, yeah, and, you know. And I think that, um, as you mentioned, uh, who I call my auntie, Aunt Roberta, couldn't make it today. I think that she could speak to this point a little bit more accurately than I could uh, because she's been interacting with different people from different communities for over a decade or more. Uh, but as I understand it, no one has been able to uh, show and prove that we are not, um, that they were actually older in terms of incorporation. Okay, so uh, good. Uh, and I'm sorry that we, we don't have Mrs. Rogers here with us today, but uh, we will provide a link later. There's a link where you can see an in-depth interview with the historical with the uh, Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois on, on YouTube and some findings that they found there yes. on, on that website that you see next to the to the photo. She definitely sends her, her regards. Um, she doesn't come into town often. Uh, nowadays, she's in town and she's actually uh, coordinating some business while she's in town, but she does send her warm regards and love. Now, the work that you all are doing for Black history and, and Illinois history yeah. is very important. Now, do the young people in your area in Brooklyn, because now, and explain to us the geography down there, like looking at this map, we, you see Brooklyn, you see St. Louis, in between there is the river, but um, what's the lay of the land and, and are the people aware of this rich history of Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of the lay of the land, the population currently of Brooklyn so at its peak, it was about 3,000 people at one point. Currently, the population is about 700 people. Uh, many of those are young people. I will say that uh, there have been a lot of people that have moved away from Brooklyn. But one of the exciting things is uh, over the past couple of years, Brooklyn, in order to, to your question, in order to uh, promote, celebrate some of that rich history has started to do what we call homecomings, uh, Brooklyn reunions. And so we're actually having one next weekend. I have family coming in from El Paso, Texas uh, to be a part of it. And this is an opportunity for uh, members of Brooklyn from near and far to come together for a food fellowship fund, but also to talk about some of that history and to preserve some of that history. It is a family uh, fun and family friendly event. 
And so um, there will definitely be much opportunities to uh, really kind of engage and talk about some of that history. One of the things that I am working on on behalf of the Historical Society is developing a connection with Brooklyn, uh, with Lovejoy School, so that we can go in and figure out ways to do some collaborative programming so that we, because history is great, right? But we have to keep it alive in the present um, and use it as a tool that will propel us into the future. So um, that's something currently that we're in the works on, on figuring out the logistics. Now you brought up Lovejoy. So when, when mother uh, Priscilla Baltimore came over, um, sometimes we'll think that when, when you leave a slave state, you know, you, you crossed over into the promised land, but there was a person there named Lovejoy. So the city is, it, it, you know, it used to be called Lovejoy and Brooklyn at the same time. Do you know who that person was, Lovejoy? Yeah, so Elijah P. Lovejoy, he was a white abolitionist. Uh, he had a printing press. He uh, was one that was avid about the cause of abolition so much so that it caused him uh, to lose his life, but uh, story goes that, so you have the town of Brooklyn that was incorporated. There was another Brooklyn uh, in the state of Illinois. I cannot remember what county it is, uh, but to eliminate some of the confusion, what they did was they didn't rename the whole community, they renamed the post office. And so the post office is technically known as Lovejoy, but the two became uh, synonymous. Yeah. Anything from the um, the, the archaeological find, any, anything significant you, you would like to mention? I was really fascinated. Um, did they uncover her, her burial place? So um, she's actually buried, and in her later years, she moved back to the Missouri side of the river, um, and she's uh, buried in Bell Fountain Cemetery in St. Louis, Missouri. What they did find is uh, where her house was located um, and they found some artifacts from that period. As I mentioned, oral tradition has it that people were, were there as early as the 1820s, um, the archeological findings, archeological dig. So initially it was a different archeological dig, uh, ISAS, which stands for the Illinois State Archeological Survey. They initially were digging in a location just east of Brooklyn. Um, this was a location that was thought to believe to be a native uh, fishing village. And so people got curious, right? Members of the village of Brooklyn got curious and they started to stop by and ask questions. And during that process, uh, began to engage the archaeologists to tell them a little bit about the history of Brooklyn. At that point, the focus of the dig really shifted to validating uh, some of the claims that the town folks were sharing with the archaeologists. Now, there are currently, I believe, two churches there that were part of the Underground Railroad. Can you tell us about those churches and are they already on the National Register of Historic Places? So uh, the two churches are Antioch uh, Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, the second church is uh, Quinn Chapel AME Church. So Mother Priscilla Baltimore was uh, a Methodist. She was a member of the African Methodist Church. In fact, uh, it has been said that she uh, entertained Paul Quinn when he visited Brooklyn. Um, at one point, as I understand it, Brooklyn was going to be considered to be the national headquarters for the AME Church uh, at one point. Uh, but to your to your question, so. Up under the, the up under the basement of Quinn Chapel is, and it still remains. Uh, I'm trying to think of the appropriate terms. It, it's basically Quinn Chapel was a stop, and uh, so up under there they have where the enslaved Africans would uh, stay, right, uh, on their quest to freedom. Many of those uh, people would come from the state of Missouri, cross over. Brooklyn would be the first site that they would come in contact with, and then way they would go further north into Alton and then ultimately out of the country. Uh, works are being done to uh, get Brooklyn national designation. 
However, uh, at this moment, I don't think either one of those churches are on the National Register. Now, these pictures that we just saw, you know where, where those are from, right? Yeah, look familiar. I mean, not vaguely familiar, but <laughs> different time frame, but yep. Yep, yep. And it was Ebony Magazine took these pictures, I want to say 1952. When would you say, um, you know, how long would you say Brooklyn was thriving until, and we're going to get into the current yes. challenges coming up, but how, how uh, up until what point would you say the, the city was thriving? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm just going off of what I've heard and, and personal experiences. I would say probably up into the 1980s. Uh, obviously, 1980s, we experienced Reagan, Reaganomics, uh, the crack epidemic, uh, you yes. the, the emergence of the dope uh, entertainment industry coming to Brooklyn, uh, which ultimately led to a uh, spike in crime and, and just, you know, the crack epidemic in, within itself uh, ravaged the community and there were so many uh, negative implications that stemmed from that. Um, the Brooklyn that I grew up in, I grew up in Brooklyn in the 80s and 90s, uh, was not the same Brooklyn that my mother grew up in. My mother often talked about, you know, Brooklyn was a place where you could leave your front door open. You could sleep on your porch and not worry about anyone um, dealing with you. Brooklyn also um, had industry. There were grocery stores, there were movie theaters, uh, there were dry cleaners. My grandparents actually uh, owned a confectionery in Brooklyn, uh, known as Grady's Confectionery. They were known to have the best hand-packed ice cream in, 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 in the area, uh, outside of Pirtles, which is located in East St. Louis. But there was a thriving economy even in Brooklyn that did not exist uh, when I came up as a young person. Yeah, I also um, want to say that on that, um... The organization who did the, the the dig over there, there was a man on the on the interview who who was talking about the Harlem nightclub. It, there was a Harlem nightclub, and that was the like the what we call the Chitlin circuit, like where these black artists, famous Nat King Cole and a lot of them, came to Brooklyn as part of you know when they would go on tour if they couldn't play not if but because they did it anyway. But some could play in white clubs and some couldn't at, at some point. So Brooklyn was entertaining some, some of the best ones yep. too. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And then the, the crack epidemic uh, decimated Black communities across the yep. country. Uh, Chicago, part of it still hasn't recovered from that time. And then you see the after effects of the adults who were born at that time and then now their children like it's a it's an ongoing we're we're all still um suffering from the crack epidemic um i wanted to remind the audience to please put your questions in the chat and i i want to bring quinn back to ask him a few questions on um the historic uh, the preservation piece you know as far as the national story so um to the audience please don't forget to bring your uh to put your questions in the chat and we will ask robert or um quinn whoever your question is directed to to answer it in just a few minutes now uh so quinn are you there is quinn back so robert the um I'm here Okay, great. So, so I wanted to ask, where is the, um, what is Brooklyn as far as historic recognition? What what is Brooklyn trying to accomplish right now? And then, what made us put uh, us, meaning Landmarks Illinois, put it on the most in danger list? Yeah. So Quinn. definitely. Oh. No, go right ahead, Robert. Quinn, Quinn can chime in after. Go right ahead. Uh, uh, go ahead, Quinn. No, please, by all means. It, yes. It's your hometown. <laughs> so Brooklyn, um, you know, quite honestly, Brooklyn has had sig a significance, not just in the state of Illinois, not just in Southern Illinois, but really um, made a contribution that should be known uh, in American history. And part of what we're doing is really just trying to write some of the incorrect narratives about Brooklyn, uh, Mother Priscilla, Baltimore, but also uh, getting on the National Registry to bring uh, attention to Brooklyn, which could, getting on the National Registry 
could have other implications, could help bring industry to Brooklyn, could help uh, with some infrastructure development. Uh, we believe that Brooklyn, you know, it's not a situation where we've lost hope. Uh, we believe that Brooklyn can thrive and will thrive. Uh, we just need some additional support. And that's why organizations like Landmark Illinois um, are so important. Uh, and we appreciate the advocacy. We appreciate the attention, even platforms like this that will help us to get the word out about Brooklyn um, and fostering relationships that will help Brooklyn move forward. Yeah, Quinn, go right ahead and, and let us know about this pars this land parceling out that's going on also. I just, just want to add real quick that, um, you know, oftentimes when we think about the National Register, we're thinking about buildings or districts, right? And in Brooklyn's case, unfortunately, most of the historic resources, the built environment has been lost. And so the National Register um, nomination that's being currently worked on is more of an, it's, it's archaeological in nature. You know, it's about the original founding of, of Freedom Village. Um, and I just wanted to mention, because Robert did mention an Illinois State Archaeological Survey. I mean, there's a lot of other organizations that have been, have been working in Brooklyn since the early 2000s. They should be recognized. Um, there is the University of Illinois Department of Anthropology. Um, Illinois Department of Transportation is actually a, a part of this effort. Illinois State Museum, um, SIU Edwardsville, and even Washington University in St. Louis. So there's all these different partners that are that are interested in, in helping citizens of Brooklyn find a path to, I guess, recovery, so to speak. Um, and to your point, Layla, the, the question about parcels, you know, historically, you know, Brooklyn did have riverfront property. And over time, the railroads have, have bought parcels from the city. And so Brooklyn is effectively landlocked between railroad properties at this point. And so I, I don't know right now what the answer to that is, um, but there's going to have to be discussions about how to maybe pull back some of the that riverfront property. I mean, because it, it's commerce, right? And you, you have ships going up and down the Mississippi, and there's a, there's a huge opportunity there um, for, for residents in, in Brooklyn to take advantage of that, um, like they did historically. So Robert, how how are how are the partners down there? I'm using that term loosely, but the people who are buying the land, like what what do they understand the efforts that that you guys have going on? Meaning, like the railroad company and that kind of thing. Yeah, if I could backtrack though uh, to speak to a point that Quinn made, uh, in addition to the railroad, uh, there's been over time some annexation. Uh, by surrounding communities. Um, we had the building of the Stan Musial uh, Memorial Bridge early 2000s. And because of this annexation by Fairmont City specifically, uh, what once was Brooklyn is no longer Brooklyn. Um, so that bridge would have traditionally, if the boundaries remained and that land was still intact, that would have been Brooklyn's land, which would have had a positive economic impact on the community. But due to annexation uh, from Fairmont City, Madison County, um, some of that land um, has been lost in, it, in addition to the railroad purchasing that land. Are we going to, and I say we, because this is so important to, to our history. So um, so what, if you had to have a punch list or or if auntie was here, Mrs. Rogers was here, what, what, is, what are her top five priorities? Like what's the top thing um, that's going on and, and how can people help who may not be in Brooklyn? Yeah, so one big thing is uh, the Historical Society of Brooklyn, Illinois has embarked on a project really to bring a sense of pride and beauty to the community. Uh, in July 2021, I believe it was, we installed a monument uh, honoring Mother Priscilla Baltimore and the 11 families uh, next to Quinn Chapel AME Church. However, uh, we did not know at the time there were some structural um, issues with the church. So um, as a result, we ended up uh, taking the monument up looking to move it to a different location. Currently, the monument is unhoused. 
Um, and the reason it is unhoused, we are we identified a spot that we wanted to move the monument. Um, and we've run into a snag with the administration, the political administration of the village of Brooklyn. Um, they've indicated that we we can't put it where we want to put it because it's not commercial land. Well, the commercial land in Brooklyn is in uh, the area that is primarily consisting of the adult entertainment industry. And, you know, just because of the sacredness of Mother Priscilla Baltimore, who she is, what she did, the 11 families, and just a vibe and spirit, spirit that we're trying to maintain uh, with reinstalling uh, the monument, as well as their their plans to uh, develop a memorial walkway that would honor families. People bought bricks that honored the families that contributed to Brooklyn. Um, again, we're, we're just wanting to add some beauty to uh, the city and bring some awareness, um, but we have run into snags. So we're just asking if the community can advocate with us on our behalf so that we can see this project move forward. Um, so that's a crucial one. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, so I don't know if I'm over talking the point or not. No, no, go right ahead. Go right ahead. I'll interrupt you soon because I want to get in another question to Quinn and then we'll go to, um, the audience and see if they have any questions, but go right ahead. I, we want to yes. know what the punch list is. Yeah. So, so, um, we are a very small organization. We are a very small organization with, uh, little to, uh, minimal capacity. And so things uh, as simple as uh, access to grant writers, um, things uh, as simple as people uh, that have various uh, skills in different industries that will be willing to partner with the historical society, uh, maybe volunteer their services. Um, it is about the historical society, but ultimately it's bigger than the historical society. It's really about us trying to preserve the legacy of our community, right? The past is great, but we also want there to be a future. And in order to be a future, there has to be some moves that need to be made with a sense of urgency. Um, so we're just asking people, you know, if, if sometimes you don't know what you need, honestly, or you don't know what you don't know, um, so, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you have some type of skill, expertise, background that you feel um, may be beneficial uh, to the Historical Society and to the Village of Brooklyn. Reach out to us so that we can facilitate some discussion about how to uh, tap into that. And Quinn, uh, on that question, and then uh, uh, another question, I'm sure you could take both. <laughs> what what do you recommend? Uh, what do you think is needed for Brooklyn um, right now and in the near future? And we talk a lot about Mother Baltimore and our cultural heritage, which is extremely important, but that legislative piece is also important. And I, I know you feel that way too about the 15th amendment i just wanted you to expound on that a little that significance a bit yeah I'll, I'll take both of those i'll start with the um the incorporation so yes we had the 15th amendment pass in 1870 um which gave black males the right to vote um you know of course there were colonies across the, the country in the east coast intermittently allowed um, African Americans to vote at that time, but none had built a town, none had created a settlement, none had um, had a majority uh, settlement where they would have to voted to incorporate. And so then, um, in addition to the 15th Amendment being passed nationally, and then in 1872, in our state, uh, Illinois passed the Cities and Villages Act. Um, which allowed for communities to vote on incorporation. Um, because prior to that, you had to appeal to the state. You had to say, we would like to be incorporated. And you had to go to the state legislature. That act in 1872 allowed for local local people to create municipalities. And so Brooklyn was the first to do that in 1873. And I think that that pretty, I think that's really the answer to why it's the first incorporated majority black town. Um, in the country. Um, and then as it relates to the to the, uh, the other part of the other question, 
you know, we, we've had discussions um, going back to, I think, November with the Historical Society. Um, we've had a lot of communication with some of the other partners I've mentioned. We're also in conversation with the National Trust, um, which has taken an interest in the story there at Brooklyn. Um, and we know that there are people who are independently doing research on the Underground Railroad uh, and the aspects of, in, in Brooklyn. So there's like this confluence of interest um, that's forming or around this effort locally. And I think that the answer in my mind ultimately is to try to bring everybody to the table, um, you know, to, to kind of create a task force or at least a sounding board for the historical society and, and residents in Brooklyn to, to help them figure out a way to, you know, forge a path forward. It's not up to us, you know, to make decisions. It's up to us, I think, collectively to offer the support necessary and to help try to find the, the tools and the resources that could be available, um, you know, to help create a strategic plan for Brooklyn, Illinois, based, I would argue, around cultural heritage um, because of its unique story, um, unique and extremely important history. Um, there's a great story to tell there. I mean, I one of the things that underscores the, the, the issues I think that Brooklyn faces, especially when we consider its history, is it was part of Route 66. It was part of a Route 66 alignment. And when you look at current maps for Route 66, it's not on there. The town, oh. was, the town was effectively ghosted. And I, that's oh. something that needs to change as well. I mean, so there's a lot of smaller things like that. Like how, how can Brooklyn benefit um, from the upcoming Route 66 Centennial in 2026? You know, there's still time to have that conversation. I think those are the sorts of conversations that you know, we need to to coalesce around and, and work together, you know, to help local advocates, you know, forge a path forward. Oh, I think that's um really, I thought that was really good. Robert, I'm going to let you comment on that before we, we have a couple of more minutes before we are going to start um, taking questions. Now, is there a way, Quinn, in your, in your experience um, to involve the I may not even know what I'm talking about right now, <laughs> to involve the legislative community to assist Brooklyn for that recognition as the first Black incorporated town in Illinois. I think that's a huge, I also, I agree with you that that is a, a huge angle to tell the story of Brooklyn too. Like that's an entirely different story right there. Is there yeah. any way to involve others to help? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, we, you have, again, we mentioned the partners that have been on the ground uh, doing a lot of the research, doing a lot of the legwork, um, having these uh, very important conversations. My understanding is that the, the National Register nomination is getting close to proceeding. Um, so, I mean, that's another key piece of the story. And uh, about legis uh, legislative action, I mean, at a minimum, and I, I have not seen... And Robert, you, maybe it has been done, but I looked for it and I couldn't find it. At a minimum, there should be a resolution recognizing this, right? Oh. And I don't know who the, um, I'm not sure exactly who the state rep or state senator is right now, but what we do know is, it, you know, Illinois is, is one of these states where local legislators, you know, are able to go into Springfield during session and find monies, right, through grants. And I think that has to be part of this discussion, especially again around the centennial, um, you know, or, or just history in general. Um, Illinois is proud of its history, and we we really should make an effort. I think I think the state legislature should make an effort to identify resources, specifically financial resources that could be brought into Brooklyn to try to help celebrate um, their history and provide a, an opportunity for another economic base. What, what do you think about that, Robert? I totally think that uh, legislative piece should be pursued and then uh, independent, not independently, but, you know, as a thing itself. What, what do you think about that? And then we'll yeah, go to take questions. Go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, we are of the, the, the stance to use whatever tool is applicable and that can help us move uh, things forward. So absolutely. Yeah, so I I am um I guess we'll talk more about the suggested task force because I know you guys are a smaller organization and you work for a living and you know but somehow maybe 
I'm, I'm sure people will reach out. Maybe some of these questions will be see, to see how a task force could be formed. Frank is, um, he's been the person advancing our slides and he is gonna let us know if there are any questions in the chat. I think Frank is, I, we can't hear you if you're, if you're talking. There we go. There he is. Apologies there. Just a little delay because I'm sharing my screen. It took a little while for the computer to get the camera back up. But thank you. Thank you all very much. Yeah, there are questions in the chat. Please add some more. Um, uh, some of it, some of them I think we we have touched on a bit, but I just want to make sure uh, we have a forum to make sure you've fully answered any of the questions. So one of them uh, is one of, one of the core issues with Brooklyn is um, what impact has the corporate railroad industry had on, on, on the community of Brooklyn, both either positive or negative? Yeah, so um, again, the dim diminishing land mass greatly is in part uh, due to the corporate railroad industry. And so it's, it's, it's been an issue that's been going on for some time and still uh, is going on. So it has had much more of an adverse uh, and think of a, a way uh, that has had a positive impact on the village of Brooklyn. And I'm so sorry to the person and the audience who asked that question because there is a photo that you can find and Robert, you can give the website in just a second. There's a photo you can see on, on there, the Historical Society's website. It's a side-by-side -side of the parcels of land that have been um, doled out over time. So sorry we didn't have that slide here, but you can go to the Historical Society's website to see I'm it. I'm going to put that in the chat now, put that uh, website. And can you say it verbally also? So it's Historical Society of Brooklyn Ill.com. So Brooklyn IL, Historical IL. Society com. of Brooklyn IL.com. Okay, go right ahead, Frank. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for that answer. Um, so we have um, another question just uh, about uh, Quinn Chapel, Amy. It's just a, a status update on the National Register nomination. Yeah, so I know it's in process. Uh, I think they're getting close to that. Uh, being finalized, uh, but I can't say that I know much more than that. Quinn, do you know about that? I no, know. okay. Just okay. Thank. I, I added up the I added the uh, link again too because okay. there's a, there's just so everyone knows like there's you can chat with uh, hosts and panelists or you can chat with everyone. Oh. So all those Zoom quirks too. So um, uh, anyway, going on on to the next question too. Um, Actually, this is one, uh, there's a couple of questions. The first one was, was uh, a First Nation fishing village found at all or any other presence, I think during some of the archeological investigations, as well as there's a question if there were any evidence of indigenous individuals or communities in Brooklyn and, and what role a native presence may have played in 19th century history, uh, the status through the current day. Yeah, so definitely uh, findings indicated that the, uh, they call it Janie B. Good site uh, was a native uh, fishing village. In terms of the native indigenous presence uh, during the 19th century, I don't know that I've seen anything specifically speaking to that topic, so I can't give a definitive uh, answer to that question. So certainly a spot where you know more investigation and more more research mm -hmm. uh, could could be done. Um, here's a question too about kind of connecting to New Philadelphia. New Philadelphia, rightly so, has got a lot of press and a lot of attention. Um, and part, part of uh, things like this is to elevate the story of Brooklyn. But uh, any idea on the connections, formal or, or otherwise, between Brooklyn and New Philadelphia? Yeah, uh, I can't speak to that. Um, I'm still learning. I am sitting at the feet uh, mm -hmm. of Aunt Roberta. So there's still just some information that I don't know. However, I can inquire about that and get back to the person. I can um, speak a little bit to that. Um, so I think this, this is what makes it interesting, right? Because we're talking about parsing very specific language. 
incorporated versus settled, right? And so actually the first um, evidence right now is the first settled town in Illinois was something called Pin Oak, um, which disbanded by the 1880s. What makes New Philadelphia unique, it was the first registered and platted town by an African-American in the United States. So and that happened in 1836. And then right after 1837, Brooklyn was platted, but as Robert mentioned earlier, it was platted by a white male. And so you have this very, it's very unique, right in Illinois. We have can can you explain what platted means for anybody who may not know that term, platted? Yeah, if you have you know, 100 acres, you're creating parcels, you're, you're putting that on a map, you're, you're making an official um, registration of what that land looks like, and then that gets registered you know, at the local, county, state level. So that's what makes New Philadelphia unique, is it was settled, registered, and platted. Um, and of course, you know, it was there for quite some time, and, and unfortunately, um, it, it withered away as well. Thank you for that, Quinn. And um, there's a question here about uh, legislative advocacy. Have you know? Have you looked at legislative advocacy from your reps at the state and federal level? We touched a little bit on um, uh, involving legislators. Uh, Quinn, just I'll turn this one to you. Um, do you feel like with, with the story and needs of Brooklyn? Um, there's a, a large educational lift that there, um, some of the larger Illinois legislature is unaware of this story. Um, uh, what has been your experience focused on this from a legislative advocacy standpoint? Yeah, I mean, over the course of the last few months, you know, again, going back into November, I, nobody knows, nobody knows this story. Um, you know, and when, when I found out about the story, I was just completely fascinated by it. You know, and it begs the question, well, why, why do we not know this story? And I, I think it's largely the same reason why we didn't know New, Phil New Philadelphia's story. You know, no, one's, no one prioritized it. And as we saw with New Philadelphia, you know, it's, it's now part of the National Park Service, right? It's a, it's a national historic site. And I think that that's Brooklyn's future. In my opinion, that should be Brooklyn's future. And I think that, you know, we have organizational support. We have from an educational standpoint to nonprofits. And I think it's imperative to get the, the state officials um, involved in this, to educate them, to make them aware of this supremely important historic resource right here in, here in Illinois, um, you know, and in a very, very um, rich history area of Metro East in general. Um, and so I think, yes, Frank, I, I think that there's space there. I think that that's, that behooves us as an organization um, I think it behooves the historical society and other partners to, you know, to to reach out to state officials and, and let them know, you know, what we have here um, as as a cultural and historic resource. And, so, and Robert, so Robert, who are your reps? Do you know your reps there? Like, um, I know there's a mayor, but like, who's your state rep and senator? Like, I'm sure they're they're probably located in where? Not St. Louis, because that's another state. So, where who, you know, yeah. what's the territory? So uh, Belleville would be like the local regional area. And do you, I, I'm just curious, like to build off of what Quinn said, um, Robert, do, do you feel like you've received um, attention from your state and federal legislators that, that is proportional to the significance of Brooklyn? Or if that's sort of a, I don't, don't want to uh, you know, be cr too critical, maybe, maybe there's a big opportunity for the legislators to participate in, in this conversation. Yes. Yeah. So to your question, definitely not proportional. Um, and there is opportunity uh, uh, to engage and participate. That's great. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Um, so just, uh, uh, Robert, it, it sounds like there's some really real challenges between some of the advocacy and the, the administration, uh, the local government, essentially. Uh, are, are there are there advocates within government that that are, are in conversation with you, or is it um, more challenges than than uh, partnership? Yeah, at this point, uh, more challenges than partnership. However, things may turn, but uh, that's kind of where things stand at, at this point. Um, here's another one too. Uh, uh, we we shared the the website for the historical society thank you 
if people want to get in touch with you, is through that site the best or how should they best reach out to you? Yep. And I can also, uh, I'll give my personal contact information. I'll put that in the chat as well. Uh, but I, I would say start with the website. And I do want to acknowledge, I saw uh, Mr. Ronnie Steele uh, mentioned that Quinn Chapel is on the National Registry. We want to stop to acknowledge Mr. Steele because he was one of the founders of the Historical Society of, Society of Brooklyn. So uh, definitely don't want to uh, miss an opportunity mm -hmm. to see his flowers while he's on the call. Yes, thank you, Mr. Steele, for, for the work that the Historical Society is doing for Brooklyn, but it's important to Black history in Illinois, and it's important to the entire state and country's history, too. Like, I, it's incumbent on us to help get the message out so that more resources and help and communications help and public education help can come to Brooklyn to let everybody know what is going on here so we don't lose what we still have there. Go ahead, Frank, any more, any more questions? Uh, we just have a comment uh, about how significant of a story this is. It's a must tell. I mean, to, to build off that, uh, Robert, have you seen um, following the most endangered listing, you know, increased attention? Are there more requests for information? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I would say even going back as, as far as, um, which it wasn't a long time ago, but one thing we did notice was um, even prior to installing the monument about Freedom Village, we started to get a lot more attention and press uh, local media outlets. Uh, part of what uh, our Roberta is engaged in uh, this weekend is speaking with local media uh, as well as some state media as well. So we're definitely getting more attention, uh, I would say, over the last two and a half, three years. And this definitely has helped bring more awareness to Brooklyn. So we're appreciative of that as well. And it's a new day too with um, media and everything. So um, there's a lot of media attention, even if it can't make it past their editors at the time, you're, you will see it grow and, and a lot of people doing their own independent media yeah. too. I'll be down in Brooklyn in July. I'm coming down on, on the weekend because I must go to this historic land and do my own little filming and talking to people because it's just an incredible story. Yeah, I saw somebody ask if it was gonna this was going to be online and available. Um, and thank you all for being here. Do we I, I we may have time for one more question, but to answer that one, this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. I'm not sure if it'll be today or in the morning, but it'll be very fast. And um, Caitlin, our communications person, she will send out an email to let everybody know when it's available. Thanks, Layla. And, and for the last question, um, I, don't, I don't see one in the chat, but I think always it's, you know, how, how can people help? So I'll, I'll give one prompt of uh, the, the Historical Society's website in the chat. That's historicalsocietyofbrooklynil.com. Uh, there's ways to get in touch with Robert. If, if you have resources that you want to share, there's also a click to donate button. I'm sure that's always appreciated to, to make a donation there. Anything else that I missed, Robert? Yeah, so again, uh, just to circle back, if we have people in the audience that have any special skills, talents, grant writers, or know of any people, uh, any people that have people in their network that can maybe get us connected to certain individuals, you know, any and everything could, could really uh, be helpful for a small organization with a big, big impact and big history uh, like the Historical Society and what we're trying to engage in. When was there something coming up that in Brooklyn that you wanted to mention at all or um, no? Any major thing coming up in Brooklyn? Robert already mentioned it, um, the homecoming. That's up this upcoming Saturday, correct? Correct, yep. So it'll start, uh, festivities start Friday and we'll go through uh, the weekend. Like I said, Brooklynites from near and far gather, uh, have a good time, food, fellowship. So looking forward to it. And like I said, this will be the 150th year of July 8th. So this will be just short of July 8th. But you know, black folks love to celebrate and we got a good reason to celebrate. So it's going to be <laughs> a end of full fun and fellowship. Great, great, great. 
So um, I think that's going to do it for, for today's snapshot. Please give our best from Landmarks Illinois to the Historical Society. And thank you to all of them who joined us today and for the work that you, you all are doing. Um, so And thanks to the audience for attending and our guests and Frank for, for working the slides and Q&A. And we'll see you soon. Like we said, this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. And in the meantime, please look at landmarks.org and see all the work that Landmarks Illinois is doing to help people save places. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.